بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيد ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب اللهم صل على محمد الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة the first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa al-Zaman. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Lubaba occupies a prominent position in Islamic history as being known as the wife of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. A lady who was the absolute embodiment of bravery, sacrifice, and dedication towards the message of the religion of Islam, as well as the son of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Indeed, Abu al-Fadl is normally disguised and discussed without any mention of his wife whatsoever. Many of these great personalities would not have achieved the success that they achieved were it not for their partners who were with them. In many cases, their partners were their backbones. They were the ones who gave them a lot of the inspiration to be able to remain strong, both in their family life as well as in their dedication towards communal service. And this goes for many of the martyrs of the 10th of Muharram, that many of them you find that their wives play a fundamental role in their achievement. But on many occasions, they are mentioned without any reference to their wives whatsoever. Many times you may hear about Habib ibn Madahir, but there's no mention of his wife, who had pushed him towards Karbala in that very difficult time in Kufa. There are mentions, for example, of someone like Zuhair ibn al-Qayn, but there's hardly a discussion on Daylam, his wife. There is a mention, for example, of Imam al Hussein salam, but hardly does anyone discuss the role of Umm Ishaq bin Talha or of Layla in terms of the strength of Imam al Hussein salam. At the end, they, these ladies, while they come to Karbala, these are ladies who come in many cases who witness their sons dying in front of them. Yes, it's not easy to not only come to Karbala but also see your sons dying in front of you, your daughters tortured in front of you. And therefore you find that the ladies of Karbala deserve a special mention. Because Karbala, were it not for the ladies, would never be with us today. We know very well that when the Imam died on the afternoon of the 10th of Muharram, after that of the males who remained alive, there was only a couple. One was an injured son of Imam al-Hasan, who is known as Hasan al-Muthanna. Another is, of course, Imam Zain al-Abideen, salawatullahu wa salamuhu alayhi. Other than that, the rest who saved the message of Karbala are the ladies. 
And this goes to highlight in many cases that the most dedicated to the religion of Islam are the ladies of the religion. Many times you'll find that be it our sisters or indeed our wives or indeed our mothers, many of them are much more dedicated to the religion than the men in the community. As I guarantee you that you'll find were it not for the ladies of the community, you would not find the success in our own lives. Many times it's our mothers who go to the majlis and you'll see our fathers chilling at home. Many times our wives are dedicated to go to the majlis and we'll make a million excuses why we should stay at home. And that highlights at the same time as well that the role of the woman within the religion of Islam is really the backbone of the religion. As in many of the women and the greatest woman of this religion were on the same spiritual level as their counterparts. If you had, for example, Jesus, his mother Mary was fundamental. If you had, for example, the Holy Prophet Khadija was fundamental. If you had Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, his wife Fatima was fundamental. But therefore you find at the same time there is a need for us to make these people's lives applicable to our own. As in tonight's analysis, it's not just the analysis of a lady who died 1,000 years ago. Anyone could give such an analysis. Rather, it should act as an inspiration for all of us, men and women alike. Because the women of Karbala are as much of an inspiration to the men as they are to the woman. But importantly to the woman, why? Because sometimes the sisters in our community feel that they are oppressed within our communities. Some of our patriarchal cultures and customs without a doubt are oppressive. Sometimes they may be in a relationship that's oppressive. They may be in a family that's oppressive. Really the only people you could look up to when you're going through a difficult time are the ladies of Al Muhammad, without a doubt. Because when you look at the ladies of Al Muhammad and you see what they went through on the 10th of Muharram, then in Kufa, then in Sham, you see that these ladies, whatever you go through in England, in America, back home in the Middle East, whatever a person goes through, you could always relate to the ladies of the 10th of Muharram. And especially this lady, why? This lady, her husband is mentioned all the time on a night like this. In some cultures, they do the seventh night of Muharram in honor of Abel Fadl. In the indo pak culture, they do the eighth night of Muharram in the honor of Abel Fadl. You find that Abel Fadl is mentioned, but there are sons of Abel Fadl who die at Karbala. Their mother has to see them die. Normally, Al Fadl and Qasim, two of the five sons of Abel Fadl, they die on the 10th of Muharram. No one ever mentions what that mother had to go through when her sons fell. Yes? No one mentions, many people mention Zainab when she sees Aun and Muhammad. But nobody mentions Lubaba, the wife of Abel Fad. In fact, for over hundreds of years, if you were to ask many of the lovers of Ahlul Bayt, what's the name of the wife of Abel Fad? I guarantee you, many would not even know. Many would not even have thought about this lady and how close she was to Abel Fad. At the end, Abel Fad. On the 10th of Muharram, how old was he? On the 10th of Muharram, Abel Fadl, according to most of the narrations, was 33 years of age. Yes, because he's born on the 4th of Sha'ban in the 28th year after Hijrah. He's about 32, 33. By that time, he was married. By that time, he had a number of children. His mom was still alive and still an important member of the family. Fatima bint Hazam al kilabiya known as Umm al banin and his wife was as fundamental as him and his wife did not go through an easy life his wife had turbulence and trials in her life from the moment she opened her eyes until two years after karbala when she died she died in her 30s a couple of years after karbala as in this wasn't a lady who lived until the age of 91 or a lady who lived until her 60s, when you see your boys die and you see your husband's body literally mutilated, it's not easy for a human to recover. But she tried her hardest to recover. And tonight I'd like to examine her pivotal role. Yes? Because you'd find that this lady, her role is fundamental in us understanding who was the backbone of Abbas like he was the backbone of Hussein. Yes? When Imam al Hussein sees Abu al Fal fall, he says, Al An in Kasara, Bahri. Now my back has broken. But who was the back for Abbas? 
Who is the one who allowed Abbas to serve Hussein with no hesitation? Who's the one who did not nag at Abbas for his service to the religion? It's his wife, Lubaba. And that Lubaba, someone will examine the following stages. Number one, which prestigious family did she hail from? And how important was that family when it came to the history of the religion of Islam? Number two, how did her two brothers die in front of her eyes? And what psychological problem did that cause to her mom? Yet she did not give up on her. Number three, what had she known about Abel Fadl in his young age that had attracted her towards him? Number four, when they got married, what names did they give their children? And how important is that when it comes to the names of our children in the 21st century? Number five, when it came towards her mother-in-law, did she prefer that her mother-in-law was not in her life? Or rather, did she become a servant of her mother-in-law? Number six, when she attended Karbala, what was her position? After Karbala, what was her position? And what happened to that lineage of Abel Fad? And number seven, after the 10th of Muharram, when the kids of Abel Fad, who remained alive, would walk into Imam Zain al abidins house, what would happen to the Imam when he would see them? Let's examine this and dissect the topic in complete depth. Lubaba was the daughter of Ubaidullah ibn al-Abbas. It's the most prestigious family you could be born into. Many Abbas later on, of course, become the Khulafa of the religion of Islam. Yes. Uh, you see people like Al-Saffah, Al-Mansur Al-Dawaniqi, Harun Al-Rashid, Al-Ma'moon, Al-Mu'tasim, Al-Mutawakkil. These are all the kings of Baghdad. They're the cousins, of course, of Al-Muhammad. In Arabic, in the community, if you're named Abbas, it's normally because of two reasons. Either Abbas, the uncle of Rasulullah. Rasulullah, of course, had a number of uncles. Hamza was his uncle. Abu Talib was his uncle. Abu Lahab was his uncle. Then he had another uncle, Abbas. Some of our brothers in other schools in Islam, when they're given the name Abbas, it's because of the uncle of the Prophet. Others are given the name Abbas because of Abu Al-Fad, the brother of Imam al Hussein. Now, that Abbas, the uncle of Rasulullah, had a number of famous sons. One of them, you all know him, Abdullah, the son of Abbas. The one who we always hear when you hear the Quran, Tafsir. Ibn Abbas said, Ibn Abbas said. Many times in lectures, you hear people say, Qala Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas narrated. That's the son of the uncle of Rasulullah, Abdullah Ibn Abbas. Then he had another son, Ubaidullah Ibn Abbas. Abbas, originally the son of Abdul Muttalib, was married to a lady. What was her name? Lubaba. Sometimes people say that Lubaba, wife of Abel Fad, is not really his wife, yes? Rather, the Lubaba that history talks about is Lubaba, the wife of Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib. No, it's normal for you to name your granddaughter after the grandma, <laughs> something normal. And it just so happens as well that Abbas, the brother of Imam al-Hussein is married to her. She, her grandma, was a brave lady. And her bravery was personified in the fact that she is the one who killed Abu Lahab, the uncle of Rasulullah. Yes? Many don't know, Abu Lahab did not turn up for the day of Badr. Abu Lahab hired someone to turn up for the war. He stayed behind. When his servant came back, he asked him, he said to him, how was the battle? He said to him, we have lost. He said, that's impossible. He said to him, we lost. He said, but we're, three, we're 950, they're 313. How could we lose? One of the people sitting next to Abu Lahab said that Muhammad had unseen forces with him. Another said, no, they are angels from Allah. When Abu Lahab pushed that person, there's a lady sitting next to him. That lady took out, she had something with her, and the narrations mentioned that she hits Abu Lahab. When she hits Abu Lahab, Abu Lahab, because of that injury, ends up dying. Yes? Tabbat yada Abu Lahab wa tab. Ma aghna anhu maluhu wa ma kasab. His wealth or his children did not avail him at the end. So her grandma was whom? Lubaba, the wife of Abbas, the uncle of the Holy Prophet. Her mother was a lady by the name of Um Hakim. Her father, Ubaidullah bin Abbas, is of course the first cousin of Rasulullah and the first cousin of Imam Ali. Imam Ali had made Ubaidullah bin Abbas governor of Yemen. 
Muawiyah knew if you got Mecca, Medina, and Yemen, then you're able to defeat Ali ibn Abi Talib. Why? Because Muawiyah had Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, and Jordan. All he needed was Mecca and Medina. Once you get into Yemen, Shi'at Ali are finished. Because a lot of Shi'at Ali were from Yemen. Yes, today, our love for Yemen, when we see the persecution, those of you who study history will see the same persecution that the Saudis are throwing towards the Yemenis happened with Muawiyah and Ali exactly. Yes. Because in Yemen, you had the tribes such as the Nakha'i tribe, you had the Midhaj tribe, you had the Hamadani tribe, these were all loyal Shia of Ali. Ubaidullah bin Abbas took his wife, Um Hagim, and he took his two sons, and he took his daughter Lubaba, who was young. He took them to live in Yemen, because you know when you become ambassador of a country, you take the whole family, you have the residence in that area. Muawiyah had a particular gang of thugs. There's no other word to use for them. Today, when you see that there are certain gangsters, you find that Muawiyah the same had these gangs of thugs. Samara bin Jundub was the leader of them. Samara bin Jundub is the one, the Quran revealed an ayah about him. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu in ja'akum fasiqum bin aba'in fatabayyanu. And to see the people in the world, and to see the people in the world, and to see the people in the world. Oh, you who believe, when an evil person comes to you with news, verify the news. Otherwise, you end up putting ignorance on a group of people, and you later regret that. Samara bin Jundub, the Quran called him Fasiq. In Ja'akum Fasiqun. A Fasiq is someone who's an open sinner. Okay? This Samara, when the Quran calls you Fasiq, do you make him a governor? Do you make him a leader? Tell me, this history that we have, don't you sometimes think this history is full of nonsense that we have in Islam? A person who the Quran calls a Fasiq, an open sinner, that person later becomes governor. That person becomes what? Walid bin Uqba was the one who this verse was revealed about. One of Muawiyah's henchmen. Samara bin Jundub, another of the henchmen. Another of the henchmen, Basr bin Artaat, or Basr bin Artaat, another of the henchmen. These were Muawiyah's gangsters. They would go and pillage towns. Anyone who gets in their way would be killed. They went to Medina. Abu Ayyub al Ansari was governor of Medina, overpowered him. They went into Mecca, overpowered Mecca. They then went into Yemen. When they went into Yemen, Basr as well as who? as well as Samara bin Jundub, went on a rampage in Yemen. Any of Shi'at Ali were killed without any mercy whatsoever. Yes? And you know these types of characters are big narrators in the hadith of other schools in Islam. These are people who next to their name says, رضي الله عن. Yes? You will find that there are certain people in Islamic history next to their name, when it comes to a hadith it says, this person is a thiqa, trustworthy narrator of hadith, he had bughat for Ali, he hates Ali. But trustworthy, because you know, if you have hatred for Ali, you must be a good human. Okay. As in, this is the absurdity of our history. In the books of people like Zahabi, next to their name, it says, hates Ali ibn Abi Talib, thiqa, but trustworthy. Wallah, once it went a step further, I remember reading, Umar bin Sa'ad, killer of Hussein, trustworthy narrator of hadith. As in a jigsaw puzzle, when it falls from a wall, you've seen when people try and pick up the pieces and put them back? There are some sects in Islam, which was a puzzle that fell, they're still trying to patch up. That's all it is. It's a patch up. You put this person here, you get a random guy here, you put a random guy here, you say you have to follow four here, you have to follow four here, you get a random guy to be your mystic, and then that's called jama'ah, ah. that's everybody in one. This person, they go in, they went into Ubaidullah bin Abbas. Ubaidullah bin Abbas, you're expecting to put up a fight. He ran away, left his kids alone with the sister and the mom. This person, of course, later is the one who takes the bribe from Muawiyah when Muawiyah offers him money to leave Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. Yes? This person, when he leaves, Lubaba, his daughter, is a young girl, and they got two other sons. Basr comes, and he sees the two boys. What does he do? Behead the both of them in front of Lubaba. Yes? He beheads the both of them. When you see now in ISIS, you see the people going around beheading. Sometimes people tell me, this is so shocking. I don't think humanity has ever seen. Study the history of Islam and you see humanity has seen worse than this. Yes? 
History repeats itself. All the same. What are you? Shi'at Ali, behead the boy, behead the boy. Lubaba, they left her alone with her mom. You know when they started doing some of the women who were Shi'at Ali? They started selling them and the price was the size of their thighs. The more meaty they were, according to that Arab custom, the more price they would get. They'd come and parade these girls. And that's why now when you see the girls who are on sale, in Mosul you see girls are on sale, in Raqqa you see girls are on sale. Same thing happened. They started selling Shi'at Ali and their girls. The women of Shi'at Ali were being sold. And this continued, by the way. Mutawakkil al-Abbas used to give one blanket between 10 of Imam al-Hadi's children. Yes. One blanket, force them that they have to share a blanket. The rest of them have no clothing whatsoever. They did this. Lubaba stayed with her mom. Her mom wandered in the desert. Her mom eventually virtually lost her head. She couldn't take seeing her boys beheaded in front of her. Did this Lubaba leave her mother alone and say, well, my mom is ill? Because sometimes if our parents become ill or disabled, we have a tendency. Where's the nearest hospice or old people's home? Throw them in there. Let them stay there and we'll come and visit them once every six months or something. This is not the akhlaq of Ahl al-Bayt Ahl al-Bayt do not leave their parents alone when they get ill or they're disabled. Nor do you go to another extreme where you don't bring someone who's a specialist carer. A balance of the two. I can bring someone who's a carer, but I myself maintain a relation as well. So what took place? She remained with her mom from that young age. She's an orphan in the sense that she, her father's left them. She's with her mom. The boys were beheaded in front of her in cold blood, her two brothers. But her iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was phenomenal. And that sometimes is the only thing that gets you through. As in sometimes when you three, see periods where you are in trouble, psychologically, emotionally abused, that trust in Allah highlights to you that there will be better days. Around the time that she's growing up, she hears about the prowess of one of her second cousins. Yes, who? Abel Fad. Abel Fad had a prowess about him and a particular rep at a young age which is unique and could be seen where? On the day of Safin when he was young. On the day of Safin, when Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was facing the opposition in Safin, you found that Imam had seen this opposition and he had his sons behind him. And he called out, he said, Abbas, come next to me. Abbas was young at the time, and, but he was known as a person of great repute. He said, Abbas, come next to me. Abel Fadl came. He said, you see Muawiyah's army? He said, yes. He said, are you ready to go out and fight them? He said, yes, I am. He said to him, very well, I want you to wear a mask. I don't want you to reveal yourself. You come out on the battlefield. When I tell you to reveal yourself, then you do. Because you know, part of that battle, they said to Ali, you can't come out and fight anymore. Yes, because Ali ibn Abi Talib is a machine on the battlefield. So they said that we will not continue the fight if you're here. So what happened? He sent out Abbas. Abbas came out, he was wearing a mask. They said to him, who are you? And he turned around to his dad and his dad said, no. Who are you? He turned around to his dad, his dad said, no. Third time, who are you? Turn around to his dad, he said, tell them who you are. He removes the mask, young man, yes? Removes the mask and says, Ana Qamar Bani Hashim, Abel Fadl al-Abbas. I am the moon of Bani Hashim, Abel Fadl al-Abbas. Someone called out, but there are already two moons in Muhammad's army, Hassan and Hussein. To which he replied, they are the sons of Muhammad and I am the son of Ali. It's the role of the son of Ali to protect the sons of Muhammad. Then he said, and they are the eyes and I am the hands. It's always the role of the hands to protect the eyes. When he had come out on that battlefield, he highlighted who he was. But alongside that, a man of patience, akhlaq. Sometimes people don't realize this about Abel Fadl. And I don't like those who narrates Abel Fadl as if he's a man who's impatient, angry, just wants to fight everyone. Abel Fadl's heart is the softest heart. And his akhlaq is the highest akhlaq. And his, he doesn't just have basar, he has basira as well. Many of us look at people. Abel Fadl has the ability to spiritually see between the veils. 
He has that ability where his purification of his soul is the highest. Abel Fadl was a man constantly reciting the Quran, constantly in his salah. You don't get to a level of devotion to Hussein just by being someone who's brave. Anyone could be brave. There are many brave warriors who were at Karbala, many famous warriors on the army of who? On the army of Umar bin Sa'ad. They're famous warriors. Yes? They could pick up a sword. You think Shimar bin Dil Joshan one day was the person who, loved, who was on the side of Imam Ali, let's say. And there were others. But Abel Fadl was a religious, tender hearted human being. Don't grow up imagining Abel Fadl as this ferocious man who's just going around trying to kill people. You will never, ever, never, ever find a man as soft hearted as Abel Fadl. And that's why when he wanted to get married, Abel Fadl, as soon as he wants to get married, who does he ask when he wants to get married? Because his father has passed away. His mother, Umm al Banin, is still alive. To him, only Imam al Hussein can tell him who he can get married to. Yes? Everything for him was Hussein. Nothing else. Everything is Hussein. From the day that he is born until the day he passed away. So he comes to Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam. Who should I get married to? And he's told, marry Lubaba, daughter of Ubaidullah bin Abbas. So young, that girl in a young age never lost her faith in God. Her, boy, her brothers got killed in front of her. She looked after her mom. She's a pious girl, respectful girl. Marry her and she will be the best wife for you. And truly, when he went to propose for her, who would get someone as beautiful inside and outside? Like Abel Fadl, most beautiful inside and out. And you found that they got married with each other. His mother, of course, was now at an age, Imam Ali had died. His mother was also extremely soft hearted. His mother was related to Lubaba because in the family tree, they're related from the side of Amr bin Sa'sa'a. Amr bin Sa'sa'a was this ferocious warrior on the battlefield. This guy used to look for wild animals and chase them. Now, normally a wild animal chases you. This guy used to look for wild animals and chase them. And like literally these wild animals would run away from him. Yes. This Amr bin Sa'sa ah was the ancestor because Aqil, Imam Ali said to him, who should I marry? And he said to him, there's a lady Fatima, her ancestor, Amr bin Sa'sa ah. You know him? Imam Ali says, yes, I know him. He said, now you trust me that you're going to have a son who's a brave guy? He said, yes, yes, for sure. Because Amr bin Sa'sa, Sa literally, if there's a wolf somewhere, he wants to go and run after it and catch it. If I heard there's a wolf somewhere, I will catch a plane. Yes, I will go away. This Amr bin Sa'sa, Sa he would go and look. So Umm al Banin, there was a relation, third, fourth cousin, but still, she's the mother in law. And today you have a stigma straight away. There's as if there's a complex straight away in a marriage where the mother in law and the daughter in law automatically a person thinks. What's going to happen? Is there going to be an argument? Baba, when you approach a relationship, naturally, naturally, there is a situation where the boy has to balance between the love of his mom, which he's raised him, and the love of the new girl in his life. Everybody is responsible for its success. The boy who's trying to balance the love, the mom who's raised him, who has to curtail some of her emotions, and the girl who should have the patience to recognize that he's trying to serve Allah from both sides, yes? When she knows that her mother is Umm al-Banin, her mother-in-law, does she say, I don't want her in our life? No, on the contrary. I'll serve her like I would serve my own mom, yes? And nor do you find Abel al-Fad turning around and saying that we don't want my mom in our life, my mom has no place in our life, no communication with his mom. On the contrary, Abel al-Fad, knew his mom was a widow and sometimes when your mom is widowed you cannot just simply leave her stranded there and come and visit her every eight nine months you take your mom in your life when she's a widow keep in touch with her on a regular whatever she needs you have to fend for her let's not move into a world where we are people with no hearts yes sometimes we could fall in that trap mom is far away i'll come and visit her every couple of years no Keep in touch with your mom, open up to your mom, especially when your dad has passed away. Have that tenderness always be there for her. Abel Fadl brought his mom in and they began to build their family. And when they were building their family, how many sons they had? Some narrations mentioned five, some narrations mentioned six. What did they name them? This is important. 
Today, I hear certain names which the lovers of Ahlul Bayt are giving their kids. I don't know what that name means, to tell you the truth, yes? Baba, don't just go on Google and just put nice names and then give it to a kid. Because Google can end up giving you a name of a child, which could be someone who's an enemy of Ahlul Bayt, but the name sounds nice. I remember, wallah, one of our good friends, may Allah bless him, innocently, innocently one day, he said to me that I've I have a young boy. I said, what's the name? He said, Sinan. Joking, Sinan. I said, what made you choose Sinan? He said, it you know, rolls off the tongue, Sinan. Sinan bin Anas, on the 10th of Muharram, either him or Shimr bin al Joshan beheaded Imam al Hussein. Now, if you just pick a name randomly when you're married, you don't know who you're naming after. Yes? You could just be getting anyone. Or some of the names I see these days, it is so reaching a level where it's like, how can I please, you know, my non-Muslim friends that I'm cool as well? You don't listen, you don't need to please people that you're cool. If you're a classy person, you could be someone who's cool. You don't need to fit everybody's names in. Oh, but my Muslim friend, if he hears that name, he won't look at me in a bad way. And some of the prophets who are, whose names no one used to ever name, everyone's naming these days, yes? There are prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nobody used to name, but now that name is good in my social circle, so I will name, which is not a problem. But when you name, you want your son to come out with the character of that name, don't you? In Arabic, we have a name, it can be Jamid or Mushtaq. There is a name which has no real applicability. There's a name which has an applicability on the character. When you come towards their son's names, what's their son? Fadl, yes. And you have, for example, the son by the name of Abdullah or Ubaidullah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allah wa sallam. Hassan, Qasim, look at Ahl al Bayt. They don't generally go far with their names. Yes. If you look at all the Imams of Ahl al Bayt, Ali Muhammad, Ali Muhammad, Muhammad Ali, the odd prophet like Musa, maybe a companion like Ja'far. Yes. But they don't go far. Why? These names, number one, the person who's given those names has to live up to that name. One day you found that our sixth Imam saw someone he had named his son. After the Holy Prophet, and he said, make sure he acts like Muhammad. Yes, because at the end of the day, when people see your behavior, they ask you, what's your name? When you give that name, straight away people ask, who are you named after? If you represent that person, then you are someone whose akhlaq has to be the highest. Number two, it gives the onus on that person, a sense of pride. That's when I'm named after Imam al-Hasan. Can I have the qualities of Imam al-Hasan in my life? Let me apply them into my life. They didn't go far with the names. They had Muhammad, they had Hassan, they had Qasim. Don't be embarrassed from these names. Wallah, I will repeat this on the Mambar until the day I die. The biggest war against Al Muhammad in early Islam was when they were looking for people called Ali and beheading them. And it happens until today. I'm telling you, Hajjaj bin Yusuf al Thaqafi on Eid al Adha asked someone, What names do people give each other? Someone said to him, You know, different names. He said, what are people doing at the moment? He said, it's Eid al-Adha, people are sacrificing animals, sheep. He said, good, go and sacrifice anyone called Ali, Hassan or Hussein. You know how they kill on the Hawiyah, on the ID? This is what was happening in early Islam. The Shia of Ali were never ever people who were scared of naming the names of Al Muhammad and their companions. Today in the year 2016, don't be worried about this. Abu al-Fadl had those sons and she remained loyal with him throughout that period until you found the tense period came. Which one? Towards the end of Muawiyah's reign, when Muawiyah announced Yazid as his successor, and you found that Imam al Hussein, where was Imam? Imam at the beginning was in Medina. They were all living together in Medina. Imam al Hussein with his wives, Abu al Fadl with his wife, they were all living together in Medina, and the Imam made the announcement that we're going to have to leave Medina. Why? Yazid had ordered that either he gives the pledge of allegiance or you kill him. And that's why anyone who tells you that the Shia killed Imam al Hussein, you know, many times they say Kufa, Shia, and Shia of Kufa killed Imam al Hussein. Now, I've even heard people in our own say that the Kufa, they're the ones who killed Imam al Hussein. What do you mean they're the ones who killed Imam al Hussein? What do you mean? Imam al Hussein, who was his army? 90% is Kufa. Habib ibn Madahir is Kufa. 
Muslim bin Ausajah is Kufa. Hur bin Yazid al-Riyah is Kufa. Someone says yes, but the rest let him down. Firstly, who are of those who let him down? Muhtar is in prison. Maytham al-Tamar is executed. Abbas al-Jadali is beheaded. Sahad Kunasa in Kufa, there was a bloodbath there. Ibn Ziyad had surrounded the whole area. You'll get executed if you are seen. A few who let him down are the ones who may not have been Shia Ali. They were just simply people who said, if, if Hussein fights Yazid, we're with him. And if it's Abdullah bin Zubair fights Yazid, we're with him. That's it. Those people may have let him down. I ask you, those people of Medina, where was their help for Imam al Hussein? You come and tell me Kufa killed Imam al Hussein. And someone's got the audacity on the internet, on the television, to say that, you know, these Shia, they cry in Muharram because of regret of how they let down Imam al Hussein. What are you talking about? Your history is full of rubbish, and now your points are rubbish. You, the one who pride yourself on telling me that Mutawakkil is a great man and Marwan is a great man, are teaching me now about history. You telling me that we killed Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, Shi'at Ali are the ones who stood with Abu Abdullah when Mecca and Medina skanked him. Mecca and Medina let him down. And who in Mecca and Medina? Abdullah bin Umar, quiet. Where is he? What's he done for Imam al Hussein? Quiet. I am not with Yazid, nor am I with Hussein. Yes. It's better that everybody remembers me, they love me. You know someone, when everybody loves him, you always get worried about that person because it means he has no principles. If you tell me someone, oh, everyone loves him, I say, you got to worry about him. That guy clearly has no principles. He's never said truth, so everybody loves him. Abdullah bin Umar, quiet. Sahel bin Sa'ad, quiet. Zayd bin Arqam, quiet. Ibn Abba, quiet. Oh, so many are quiet. The grandson of Rasulullah is about to be beheaded. Who stood up for him? Who? His family and his close companions. And companions from Kufa who ran to, while their life was at stake, knowing they'll get killed. Seeing Muslim bin Aqil beheaded, seeing Hani bin Urwa beheaded. And they came to the aid. Imam said to his family, we had, and Abu al-Fadl was with him in Medina. There was a moment they were going to kill him in the palace. In Medina, Yazid's ambassador was going to kill him in the palace. And you found that when he was walking in that palace, Wallah, when he was walking in that palace, he was walking and you had that these people were about to behead him and Abu al-Fadl steps out. And he looks around at all the palace has anyone got an intention to kill my brother? And he remains patient. He looks around. Now that night, Imam al Hussein said, get your family, Lubaba. Those who don't want to come, don't have to come. Some family members didn't come. Yes. For different reasons. Some were older age. Some their eyesight has gone. You know, people like Abdullah bin Ja'far, Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya. Some have other roles to play later. Yes. But... Lubaba said, we take. Some of the kids they took, the youngest one stayed with Umm al -Banin, The mother of who? Abbas. She stayed behind. Because you have Fatima Sughra stays behind. Others stay behind. Because some of these kids are not feeling well, cannot go that night. Abbas, his wife, all of them leave Mecca, Medina. They go to Mecca. The hope is that near Allah's house in Mecca, there is a hope that what? There is a hope that the Muslims will come together. Imam al Hussein stands up, tells everybody, I am the grandson of Rasulullah. This Yazid has been chasing us, oppressing us. All of you have to stand up. Some of them are hesitant. There is a famous narration that Abu al Fadl stands up. And those of you who've seen my majlis a few years ago, Abbas's sermon on the Kaaba, it's on YouTube, you can watch it. When Abu al Fadl stood up on the Kaaba and gave a sermon in front of everybody. And one of the lines of the sermon was what? You scare me and my brother with death when as children we used to play with death. You look forward to serving a man who drinks alcohol and leave the man who will serve you the drink of Kothar. Allahu Akbar. And then he says a line, every lover of Abbas in this hall who has a hajjah with Abbas for his Babel Hawaj. 
Every lover of Abbas will relate to this line. None of you, none of you, none of you will reach my brother unless you kill me. Yes, that's a that's foundation of loyalty to an Imam. None of you will reach my brother. You want to go and support that man and leave Sayyid Shabab Ahl al Jannah. And he delivered that sermon. Where in the Kaaba and there's people everywhere. So no one touches my brother. And Yazid had made the announcement. Yazid had said, I want Hussein beheaded by the Kaaba. In Islamic law, if a mosquito comes on your body by the Kaaba, you can't touch it. And the grandson of Rasulullah, you behead. And that's why all the poets come together on these very lines. What do the poets talk about? They talk about the fact that in Hajj, there was a Qurbani of Ismail. And a few days later, the Qurbani of the son of Ismail. Yes. And in Hajj, we honor the Kaaba. A few weeks later, the man is killed whose grandfather bought the Kaaba and looked after the Kaaba. Yes. You found that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam with Abu al-Fadl has to leave because they're going to behead him. So firstly, Medina, Medina wanted to behead him. Imam left. Mecca wanted to behead him. Imam left towards Karbala. Yes. And they left towards Karbala. When they left towards Karbala, the ladies would all come together and it came to the night of Ashura. Many times people mention, they mention Zainab talking to her sons. No one mentions Lubaba, wife of Abbas, talking to her boys. Yes. Because you've got these boys, and all of them are still young. If Abu al-Fadl in Karbala is 33, then I ask you, how old are the boys? Yes. And she wants them to make her proud in front of her mother-in-law, Umm al banim and Fatima al-Zahra, of course. And the narrations, what do they mention? They mention that a couple of the boys of Abbas had gone out to fight. Firstly, who? The brothers of Abbas went out to fight. How many brothers Umm al banin gave? Umm al banin four sons at Karbala. Abbas, she had Aun, Ja'far, and Abdullah, who some give another title of Uthman. Four of them she gave in Karbala. And the mom is where? The mom is in Medina. The mom is where in Medina? How is it for a mom when her sons have gone? And how is it for a mom who has a son like Abbas? And she had told him from a young age, everything in this life is for Fatima's boys. Yes. I expect you to look after Fatima's sons. They are my life. Which mother? You would think she'd say my sons. It's all about Fatima's sons. Yes. You want, you want to look after someone? You look after her boys. Abbas saw his three brothers go. And they done an amazing job. Wallah. These are Imam Hussein's brothers. Yes. And each one gave their life away. And then he had to see his two boys, Fadl and Qasim. And those boys made their fathers proud, yes? Until it came to him. Before it came to him, and we all know his one, his narration's coming because his narration is a special narration. He deserves his own. After Karbala, she had seen her husband's body dead, mutilated. After Karbala, did she leave? No, she stayed with Sayyidah Zainab. And one may argue, how many Karbala's after Karbala? Allahu Akbar. Because they go through the streets of Kufa and Sham. And they have to see their beloved's heads on spears. I ask you, is there a greater massacre than Karbala? Is there a greater tragedy than Karbala? Wallah, there isn't. Wallah, there isn't. Spears, and imagine Layla sees Hussein's head and Akbar's head. And Zainab has to see Aun and Muhammad's head. And this Lubaba has to see her boys and Abbas. And they go through the streets of Kufa. 
And some are asking, who are these ladies? The same ladies who only a few years earlier, their uncle was the Khalifa of Kufa. And then from there, you know, when they went from Kufa to Sham, they didn't just jump from Kufa to Sham. You don't take a flight. You got to go to cities that hate you. Stones pelted on the woman of Al Muhammad. Yes. Stones pelted on the woman of the message of Islam. May Allah never show you a day where someone bullies your daughter, let alone th throws a stone on her face. Yes. And you know when they get to Sham, they parade them in Sham. And one narration mentions, what did they do to these women? Lubaba and Zainab and Layla and Daylam and, and Um Kulthum. What did they do? The first thing they called out in Sham, these are the daughters of the man who defeated you at Khandaq and Khaybar. Go out and attack his children. <laughs> and Wallah, Imam Zayn al Abdeen. He says, I saw a man poke his spear into the waist of my auntie Zainab. Yes. And then after that, he said, I saw someone and he, boil, he threw boiling water on my turban. And then he said after that, one of the people said to him, what do you want? He said, get me a piece of cloth. He said, why? He said, I want to place it between the chain and my neck. The chain has been cutting me since Karbala. It's Masaib of Al Muhammad. And this Lubaba then, they get taken to the court of Yazid. They're paraded in the court of Yazid until they return back to Karbala. When they return back to Karbala, they of course return back to their bodies. Then after Karbala, they return to Medina. There's a few people in Medina you have to tell now. You have to tell what's happened to their, uh, to their sons. You have to tell what's happened to their dads. How do you tell Fatima Sukhra what happened to Hussein? <laughs> How do you tell Fatima Sukhra what happened to Asghar? What do you explain? There's a few people you have to tell. How do you tell Umm al what happened to Abbas? <laughs> now I'm going to give you this narration. Any Hajjah you have, and while you listen to this narration, whatever Hajjah you have from Allah, those of you whose children are in difficulty, while the tear comes down, ask the Hajjah. Those of you whose families are in difficulty, marriages are in difficulty, your rizq is in difficulty. Never doubt Umm al -Baneen. Never. Umm al banin her du'as are all answered. Wallah. <laughs> and she holds, she's holding Abel Al-Fadz youngest boy. <laughs> there are mothers who listen to this majlis. There are mothers who listen to this majlis. You don't want to see anyone holding your boy. And this lady is holding Abel Fadl's boy. Lubaba comes back. <laughs> Bishr bin Hadlam had returned back to Medina. When he returned back, he called out to the people of Medina, come, there has been a massacre in Karbala. Yes. <laughs> and then one lady comes walking towards him. She has a boy in her hand. She says, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Ya Allah, Ya Allah, she says, what happened? Tell me, please tell me what happened. He asked, who is she? They said to him, you don't know Umm al -Baneen? You don't know Umm al-Bani. <laughs> he said to her, May Allah reward you over the death of your son Ja'far. She replied with a line, 
you will never hear this line from any lady again. She said, tell me about Abba Abdullah. <laughs> He said to her, may Allah reward you over your son. Aoun. She said, tell me about Abba Abdullah. Said, may Allah reward you over your son, Abdullah. She said, I ask you about Abba Abdullah. He said to her, may Allah reward you over your son, Abbas. She dropped the child of Abba father on the ground. <laughs> Only Abbas's name broke her down. But even then she said, tell me about Abba Abdullah. <laughs> they all began to embrace each other. She saw Lubaba, she embraced Lubaba. <laughs> she embraced Lubaba. And then she asked, where's Zainab? <laughs> She began to walk towards Zainab's house. Zainab had told Fidla, don't let anyone enter. She heard the door knock. Bibi Zainab said, Fidla, don't let anyone enter. She went, she opened the door, she turned around. She said to her, it's Umm al at the door. <laughs> At that moment, Umm al ran towards Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. <laughs> Sayyidah Zainab, what did she call out? <laughs> she called out, Wa Abbasa. <laughs> Umm al called out, Wa Husayna. <laughs> Do you know what one of the poets says Umm al said? If you gave me all of the heavens and all of the earth and you gave me 70 Abbas, I'd swap all of them to see the holy head of Abba Abdullah in peace. Yes? Who shows love like that? One narration mentions that she wouldn't cry for Abbas. One person heard Imam Zayn al Abri and said, Is this true? I said, Yes. He went and spoke to her. I said, Why? What's wrong? She said, I don't believe my Abel Fadl would have left Abba Abdullah. What did Imam tell her? He said to her, I wish you had seen the way he defended Abba Abdullah. He began the narration and he got to the line about Abbas with the water. He said he had the water in his hand and he could have drunk. But he turned around, he said, how can I drink and my brother's thirsty? And truly that moment when he lay on the ground without any of his arms broke the heart of his mother, Umm al -Banin. And he called out, Abba Abdullah, I beg you come towards me. Because they had struck him. They had started to hit him when he was on the ground. His arms weren't even with him. Imam al Hussein was trying his hardest to get to him. Abbas's final words when they were hitting him, I beg you leave me let my master come towards me <laughs> one narration mentions the arrow in his eye meant he couldn't see where he was so how did he know it was Hussein who was holding him yes it's because he felt the lips of Imam al Hussein on his cheeks he placed his head on the lap of Imam al Hussein. Imam took the head of Abbas. He placed it on the lap. When he placed it, at that moment, Abbas removed his head. Imam took the head again. Abbas removed it again. He said to him, Abbas, what's wrong with you? Why? He said, we will take your head in a moment, Abba Abdullah. Yes. 
the final lines, Imam wanted Abbas for once to call him his brother, yes? Abbas his whole life had said, Master Hussein. So at that moment, Abba Abdullah said to him, I want to hear you call me Akhi Ya Hussein. And then Abbas replied to him, I have one request from you, Abba Abdullah. I said to him, what is it? He said, don't take my body back to the tents. I promise you, Kaina, what? Leave me over here and let you kind of know that I tried to bring in the water back to the tents. May Allah reward all of you. Inna lillahu wa inna alayhi raji'oon. Ya Allah, in the name of Bab al-Hawaij, this is the time for your hajjat. In the name of Umm al-Baneen, the stranger in Jannat al-Baqiyah tonight. Never forget that Imam Zain al Abidin, whenever he would see the children of Abbas, he would cry as he remembers Abu al Fal. <sighs> ya Allah, in the name of Bab al Hawaij and all of those who've asked me for their hajat, all of those of you who have emailed me with your hajat, those of you who've asked me for your hajat, at the same time, those of you who have requested the dua. Of the holy verse. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Amma yujib al Mufthara ida da'a wa yakshif al Su'a. Amma yujib al Mufthara ida da'a wa yakshif al Su'a. Amma yujib al Mufthara ida da'a wa yakshif al Su'a. Amma yujib al Mufthara ida da'a wa yakshif al Su'a. Amma yujib al Mufthara ida da'a wa yakshif al Su'a. Ya Allah, in the name of the First of Abi Abdullah, answer all of our hawaij tonight. Ya Allah, in the name of the arms of Abu Al-Fadl, answer all of our hawaij tonight. Ya Allah, our hearts are in Karbala, Bain al Haramain. Yes. Ya Allah, raise us on the day of judgment with Fatima when she holds the hands of Abbas. Ya Allah. Ya Allah, for the originators of this majlis, allow them to receive the Shafa of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sonat in Fatiha, but before it, the loudest of your salawat. Matam al-Hussein. Ya Hussein.